one um, a little bit deeper that we haven't talked about yet today that has historically been prioritized by female voices in activism and politics. And that's the intersection of consumer protection and healthcare. Women have often been some of the loudest voices speaking up when businesses are not keeping consumers safe, whether that comes from toxic regulation, re regulation of dangerous toxins or, or dangerous products, often for women and children. And as we know in the last four years under the Trump administration, a lot of our federal protections for consumers, particularly when it comes to environmental and health hazards, have been hollowed out. Um, what would you propose to do as a member of Congress to help allow citizens interact more safely with businesses and uh, to ensure that they, they can trust and, and have the information they need to keep their families safe? We would now be starting yeah, with uh, Cam. Yeah, so, so this is a great question. It's one that um, I'll be frank, I don't have a ton of experience or expertise on. What I do know is that when I worked in the Obama administration, it was in the era of a lot of consumer protections. You'll recall that Elizabeth Warren helped create um, the, you know, an entire entity to, to address consumer protections. And you're right, women absolutely have been in the leadership role on this. I think that a lot of it just has to do with making sure that our companies, that, that everybody's held accountable. And I think that our justice system is meant to do some of that, uh, making sure there are adequate remedies for folks who do suffer harm at the hands of corporations or at the hand of products. Um, but also it's making sure that we can advocate, you know, appropriately for the services and goods that we need. Uh, you mentioned the healthcare space in particular. Um, we are always concerned about consumer needs, consumer protections in the healthcare space. And, uh, and yes, women have been at the forefront of that, but really across the board, we've just seen how, um, you know, folks aren't getting the adequate protections when it comes to prescription drugs, when it comes to, uh, and, and then also this speaks to tort reform somewhat, you know, the idea of what remedies are ultimately available for individuals. So I think for me, it's just looking to legislatively support those, those agency actions to have adequate consumer review, to make sure that we're uh, you know, keeping track of what's harming the environment and what's harming individuals, and that there's adequate resource or recourse rather uh, for anyone who is harmed. But, um, but this is absolutely an area for me to continue to grow and learn it. So RD, you'd be next. One small idea, Sally, is to make sure that there's an ombudsman in these organizations to advocate for consumers from the from the inside out, as it were. But but honestly, the biggest issue here that I have, Sally, that I can see is the consolidation in our economy. As fewer and fewer companies have gathered more and more users, or more and more revenue, or more and more whatever they products, they have started to do more what an economist like Sally would say, more rent seeking with the government. Continue to get special favors, to get you know different tax rates, to get uh, their products perhaps pr approved in a different way. And so honestly, the best way to protect consumers is two things. First of all, limit that monopolization to a certain degree when it's, uh, when it's fair and just. And then secondly, making sure that there's a vehicle for people to advocate at the federal level to make sure these products are, take, are, are introduced to the market in a safe way. Uh, we know a little bit about how drugs are approved. We know a little bit about that type of process. But what are the processes for other types of uh, products that come to the market? Understanding that better, making sure there's an advocate there for consumers uh, along the path. These seems like very reasonable things we can consider uh, when we get to Congress. Thanks, D. John, you'd be next. Uh, one idea uh, is my daughter talks to me about a pink tax how women have to pay tax on certain uh, items that uh, you know, they, they require for, for certain needs um, that are uh, out there and uh, are extra charges on, um, you know, on, on women that uh, uh, have to uh, have these products. Uh, we should get rid of that. There shouldn't be a reason for additional charges and taxes on top of women's health care health products um, uh, that men or others don't have to access. Uh, I think, Sally, where I'm going to go with this answer is money and politics, because I think the reason that you see um, our, our environmental laws, which have directly affect uh, toxins in our environment, or for that matter, our food, um, which is a huge issue now, especially in this uh, pandemic, food insecurity, um, a lot of that is protected by big money in politics, by lobbyists who are allowed access to um, Capitol Hill that bend the curve, that uh, sway the con that um, change the conversation. If uh, you know, I took something called the American Promise, which was talk, which was getting money out of um, getting money out of campaign. It was campaign finance reform, but we even need more um, comprehensive reform in Washington D.C. 
uh, to keep big money out. You know from just the Commonwealth of Virginia how much influence Dominion Energy has. Um, clearly, they have it not only at the state level, but at the federal level, and we need to address that and remove the inequalities that that creates in our, in our country and in our, in our communities that are reflected in the cost, the higher cost of goods, whether they be prescription drugs or food or gasoline um, or any, any product that we shop for. Thanks very much, Claire, and could you finish, or John and Claire, could you finish us off? Yeah, um, so I think this is about the way that we treat corporations. I mean, Citizens United gave corporations the ability to act as individuals, right? But, but then we have laws that, that enable corporations to escape the liability an individual would, would be assigned um, it, it, when they're operating in the corporate world. And there has got to be corporate accountability at, at a bottom, the bottom line. And this is, we see this with, with you know, the deregulation. We, we see the Republicans, you know, Denver Riggleman is actually famous for this. It's one of, I mean, it's just shocking. Um, deregulating dangerous chemicals that pollute our water supplies, cause cancer, um, in the name of promoting small businesses. Well, I think that what we need to do is hold corporations accountable for their behavior. Um, and, and, and I think that we need to encourage the growth, growth of small businesses that are naturally accountable to their community, who can be held accountable. And I, I just had a conversation with, with uh, some supportive friends of mine who are, are involved in the legal community right here and was asking them questions about our zoning laws, about, uh, about the way that we are, what else can we do at a local level to encourage the growth of small businesses? From a federal level, when we're doing things like building recovery acts, uh, you know, post COVID, we need to ensure that that money is not going into the hands of corporations, that the buyouts aren't going into the hands of, of stockholders. Though, though that money needs to be going into the hands of workers and individuals and saving our small businesses. And I brought him up last time, but Roger, right down the street here, the sort of de facto mayor of, of Earliesville, mechanic, can't make payroll and can't get a loan because he doesn't have enough debt. <laughs> you know, he, he's, he, it, it is, um, We've got to hold corporations accountable. Sorry, I went over time. <laughs>